Growing garden fare that's out of the ordinary can be challenging, but oh so rewarding. Tonight we head to an organic garlic farm for a look at how to grow an array of beautiful pungent bulbs. And we'll show you trees and evergreens you'd never know you could grow in your own backyard. That and more next on Great Gardening. If you look, you actually see the growth for next year. This is a plant that's been infected with early blight. I can feed a lot of people. I always want to use a garden fork. You just wrap it. Take a look at the environment, try to work with your environment. Hello and welcome to this edition of Great Gardening. I'm Pamela Fish, along with our garden experts, Tom Casper, the Supervisor of Park Maintenance for the City of Duluth, and Bob Olin, horticulturist and state and regional educator. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Well, we've got an awful lot of moisture out there <laughs> this week. I would say the drought has officially ended. I think so. The fire yeah, it looks danger like it's, is over. It looks like it's going to continue, too. So, uh, yeah. What can we do in, in lieu of getting out in the yards or put on our rain gear? <laughs> Number one, don't, don't get discouraged. Let's okay. put it that way because we've all been through this and we share your pain if you lost some of your recent seedings. Just come in and reseed. We've got enough time here. We're, we're working on toward the end of May, but we have enough time to get things reestablished if you lost some of your crop. Also, uh, be a little alert. If, if that seed doesn't get out of the ground, you're on a heavier soil, you may again want to replant because uh, seed can rot under these kinds of conditions uh -huh. as well. Okay. So Bob is suggesting not to give up. We, and it's we only never, May. Ever, we and never it's only ever May. give up. Yeah. I'll be saying that in early August. Too. <laughs> yes, that's, right. <laughs> that's when we will be planting garlic for the next year. No. All right. Well, we also welcome back our phone volunteers who are standing by to answer your called in questions. They're from Duluth Garden Flower Society, Lake Superior Master Gardeners Club, and they were smart. They wore their rain slickers, they brought their umbrellas, they have their rain boots, and we're so happy to have them here tonight. Please give them a call, 218-788-2844, or call toll-free the number you see there on your screen, and they will get your questions to our experts for up-to-the-minute information and advice. Well, Tom... Bob, I know that you guys grow delicious things to eat, but do you do any cooking? I do. <laughs> love to cook. You love to cook? Yeah. I'm learning. You're learning? I okay. made a great spinach salad today, so oh. I, that's a start at least. And it must is. have finished it because he didn't bring any. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I love to cook as well, Tom, and I love to eat, and I cook a lot with garlic. We know a <laughs> 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 I'll have to share some with you next time so that, that. so that we all smell the same. <laughs> but I was thrilled to visit an organic garlic farm, and here's a look now at how they raise up that aromatic crop. I'm Gwen Levesque. This is my husband, Tiger, and uh, we're in Port Wing at Northern Sunrise Gardens, and we grow garlic, and we grow other alliums, and we grow all of our own vegetables. The process that I do is, is the digger, is that we take a, just a regular garden fork and we go down, but we have to make sure that we don't hit the garlic bulbs. And we try to get below them and pop them up. We plant before um, Columbus Day for our area, and it's planted, mulched, and forgotten about until about April when it starts to emerge. At that time, we take all the straw off that you see on some of these other ones, and that's to give it a chance to, for the soil to warm up. Then um, about late June, depending on the year, it puts up a scape, and we have to cut all of those off. The reason for that is we want the energy to go into the bulb. Now after we uh, take these out of the ground, the bulbs themselves are really fragile. They scratch very easy, so we have to take them and take very much care of them. And we take them and put them in our wheelbarrow, but we have these towels to protect them from the rough surface. And then we cover them up. So number one, the sun doesn't get on them. Places that have a more sandy soil or a, a more porous soil, a much better soil for growing garlic, 
they can pull them out. <laughs> so it's a lot easier than what we have to do, but we have to dig because our soil is so heavy. But the neat thing is there's so many minerals in the red clay that our garlic tastes different than garlic grown in sand. So it's extremely labor intensive. When we bring them in, we keep them, we do a few at a time so they don't dry out because it's a lot harder when they dry. And we take the bottom dead leaves off. And we also have to get the mud out of it. We use forks <laughs> and sometimes a toothbrush. This is the hard part. I mean, it's if we could be in sand, all we'd have to do is shake them off. The difference is in the flavor. Um, it's got more minerals. It turns our garlic, the water content and the minerals turn our garlic pink or, or give it a rosy color. They have to cure before the flavors, the different flavors become evident. And so we, we uh, you know, our customers know that and we cure it at least three weeks. That, that um, guarantees that it will keep for them under right conditions, but the flavors are evident then. When it's done here, it's hung up in bundles of uh, 10, as you see there. And then we leave the roots on and the green part on because the bulb will absorb something out of that. But I cut the tips off to help it dry a little quicker. After the three week period, I start walking around um, looking for the different dates and the three week thing. And then I take that down and they're dry by then. And we clip the neck, we clip the bottom and we examine them for, you know, how they're supposed to look. And then, um, then I choose my seed and then I fill my orders. And there are six varieties and then there's different ones under each variety. And each variety has distinctive differences. There's one that's really good for chili. There's a couple of them good for spaghetti. There's some that are good for salsa. These, they have large cloves. They're wonderful for roasting, baking, but they have a different texture than ones like the other, the purple stripes are crisper and mm, delicious. <laughs>well they were wonderful to have us out there and i went out later for their uh, open house that they have in the fall got myself a big bag of garlic bulbs and oh they're de they are delicious now, did you as plant Gwen them said, or did you oh, no. did I you ate consume them. <laughs> <laughs> i cooked them <laughs> you, you you ate the seed potato or the seed I did, garlic. I did. <laughs> what a great story about but were i to plant them yeah. i would take just one of those cloves right from the bulb that's right mm -hmm. they're, they're really relatively simple to grow easy to grow what's really nice about them and timing is important you don't want to go too early she suggested columbus day mid-october although i've gone as late as mid-november as long as you've got a mulch in you want to get them in the fall and uh and you know then mulch them in typically so that we don't have any winter damage and then they're up early in the spring and they're relatively easy to uh grow they're a great great plant and then for anyone with culinary skills they're fantastic that way as well they are indeed yeah, what a great mm. story about a couple of wonderful gardeners i mean mm -hmm. just yeah. showing how we can do things and really do them how people had grown garlic hundreds of years ago and, they truly and live off hands. the land out there in yeah Wayne. beautiful mm -hmm. story and what's so great is people bemoan the fact they've got clay soils so here's a great family couple here they have clay soils and doing a marvelous job with a little bit of modification raising the beds and getting a little organic and there you can do a great job with clays all right. Well, time to take some questions from our viewers. And uh, we have a couple from last week, and, and some new ones are coming in. But I wanted to get to this one from Rod from International Falls. He has a large white spruce that he trimmed. It is wondering what could he plant underneath it? It gets morning sun. Would a hosta be OK there? Well, really, anything would be fine <clears throat> as long as he gets water to it. You know, a, a spruce is, of course, shaped like very conical so that water sheds off of it. So he wants to make sure he gets good water or supplemental water in those uh, times of the year when we're not getting a lot of rain like unlike right now uh -huh. but uh, and and also look at the soil oftentimes underneath those those uh, big trees it sort of gets a little uh, not very good soil so look at putting some additional organic matter into it and improving the soil structure and he can plant just about anything under it okay. you know in the shade what's great imp impatience and begonias you know they're wonderful yeah. plants oh, sure. that love that shade but mm -hmm. as you point out a little bit of additional moisture a little bit of extra fertility 
Okay. Missy from Lakewood wants to know what to use to fertilize tomatoes, cucumbers, and pumpkins. Are those different things? They're all going to be different slightly. Okay. And the big difference is the, uh, the vine crops, cucumbers, and pumpkins are going to take quite a bit more nitrogen, whether your source is a manure or compost or synthetic. Uh, tomatoes, you've got to be a little careful. Not quite as much nitrogen, more phosphorus and potassium. Shannon in Hermantown planted her potatoes uh, a week ago. Wants to know, due to the rain, does she need to replant them? Uh, hopefully not. Uh, you know, they should be up and out of the ground, and, and hopefully we dry down a little bit here. Uh, she should be fine. If they're rotting, dig in there and look for these things. And if there is rot in there and they're not emerging, there's still plenty of time. You can replant potatoes up until, uh, you know, maybe June 10th or so, and you'll be just fine. Okay. Al from Proctor says, uh, little holes are in my apple tree. They're about an eighth of an inch in diameter, two feet to four feet up the trunk. The tree is 15 years old. The holes are two inches apart. Well, we're seeing a lot of sap sucker damage, and, oh. and we saw some even on our trip to Bayfield. Mm -hmm. Talked to some folks about that along the way. And, and seen it on very mature trees where they're just fine um, and can live right through it. So that, not real panic, but may want to look at trying to protect that bark to keep that bird away from it. Okay. Good Mary point. from Duluth has a Black Hill spruce that's dead in the middle but has good growth on the ends. Can it be saved? Well, you're never going to replace that lost material in the inner portion of the tree. But if, as long as there's growth on the outside and it doesn't look unsightly, uh, it, it's living, it's fine. Just keep, keep it growing. And that's really kind of natural growth for an evergreen tree to lose those inner needles as it matures and grows. So really all of that growth is on the outside edge of that tree. So it's pretty common to not have sure. a lot of uh, growth on the inner part of the tree. Okay. And Black Hills is a good native. It's actually a white spruce, good native, good winter hardy, and it isn't very disease uh, prone at all. So it's a fine tree. Here's one about a white pine. It's from, I think, Sharon in Nashwalk. It's a 15-year-old pine. Outer bark is black and splitting vertically. Can that be treated or mm. is that an issue? Oh. Uh, we'd like to take a look at the needles. Our big, when you get to about 15 years, it's, it's prime time for uh, blister rust. That would be the first concern. There isn't a lot that you can do about that. I don't, I don't think there's anything we're going to do here. But I, it, I, I sure would have tried because, unfortunately, I lost my beautiful white pine in my backyard this past uh, summer due to blister rust. So, yeah, not a lot she can do about it. Hopefully that's not the case, though. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we talked a lot about this last week, how to get rid of Creeping Charlie, but Ron and Eveleth is also wondering about red hawk flower. Oh, hawkweed more than likely is what okay. he's referring to. Uh, another tough one there. I would say it's got a very uh, furry leaf and uh, getting penetration. You can use the same kinds of materials we talked about, um, which would include many of your herbicides, but he wants to use some kind of a uh, non-sudsing soap. We call them surfactants. Uh, and I'll use a commercial name. If you can get some basic H, that's probably what the consumer can access. Add some of that so it breaks down the surface tension on these products and you get penetration down into the leaf surface. The other thing is they grow well on low fertility soils, so he will want to soil test and make sure he brings up his phosphorus, potassium, gets nitrogen so the grass can, in fact, outcompete the orange hawkweed. Otherwise, it'll be back again. Okay. Um, Laura Lee lives in an apartment in Duluth and wants to know if she can plant a bleeding heart perennial in a container. Well, she can, but more than likely it's not going to survive over the winter. So if she does, she can enjoy it in the gar or in, on her patio for the summer and then find a place to plant it or give it to a friend to plant in their garden. And then she can bring it back into the container next spring. Um, and it, she can do that as long as she wants or year after year, as long as she gets those roots protected in the winter. Uh, different than what happens on a container that's standing there. So. Tom, do you think possibly a real large container so that it self-insulates? If they want to do it that way and keep it pruned down, that might be a possibility. Yeah, you probably probably need right, about a 30-inch really. or 36-inch <laughs> so container. Can get big. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are beautiful, though. All right, well, that's all the time for questions right now. We'll have more coming up later. Um, sometimes interesting species of plants and trees we might want to grow just won't work in this climate. Yet there are many original varieties that are well worth trying. This week's tour takes us to a Duluth home encircled in some wonderfully unique conifers, plants, and trees. Oh, we're Nancy and Paul Gregg. Uh, we live in Lakeside. This is Rockview Court. Uh, our house is right across from the uh, the hill over here, so um, that's where the Rockview Court name comes from. We have quite a few unusual specimens here, and so you will see a lot of conif conifers here that, that just don't live anyplace else in Duluth. 
and they live here. They seem to like our yard. This is the, the first section of our yard that we did. Um, over here you see a mop head cypress, this bright kind of greeny yellow. This is a Vardar um, Valley boxwood. It's not supposed to grow here, but it seems to like our yard fairly well. And this tree right here is a horse chestnut. It's one of the few in Duluth. And on the right is a weeping larch. The weeping larch is a relative of the tamarack and it loses, it, the needles turn bright yellow in the fall and then they all fall off. So it's a really interesting tree. It's, and this is just about full grown. This is probably my favorite tree. This is a, 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 a Serbian spruce and it's about maybe 15 years old. It's perfect for this corner because it's very narrow and gets so high. We're in a very strange little microclime sheltered by the hill up there and quite close to the lake. So we don't get color till way after most people have lost theirs. On this side is my favorite tree, which is the uh, California redwood tree, Sequoia. Um, it's been there for probably 10 years. Uh, the top of it, the top four or five feet of it froze out about uh, oh, four years ago, but now it's got a new leader and it's starting to go up again. So if you all want to come back in about 100 years, you'll maybe see a uh, 100 foot tree here. You can drive through it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a silver tipped um, Korean spruce over here. It has very, very gray ends on it. Then over on our other side is, a, is another spruce. It's a gold-tipped white spruce. One of the best thing about all these conifers is all the different cones that hang on them. This little beauty <laughs> is a uh, pseudo-camellia. And it does get flowers on it that look, are very camellia-like and wonderful, sweet-smelling. This is a nine bark. The variety is Diablo, and it's this color all year round. It does have flowers on it. That's what all these little pods are from. We still have hydrangeas in bloom. This is an angel's blush hydrangea. It's white when it first comes out, and then it turns deeper and deeper pink. This is the lime ricky hydrangea behind it. You can still see a little tinge of the bright green on the flowers. The ponds have uh, been here for about five to six years. We keep them stocked with both goldfish and uh, several varieties and also koi. Put a heater in the pond, which keeps the water just, just above freezing, just so it doesn't freeze, and a bubbler for air, and all of them survive. They're still active, but they uh, uh, fatten up for the winter. It's Catoni ester. Just a very low ground cover. This is a full moon golden maple that's close to you. It has very interesting leaves. They're, um, they don't look like full moons, but they're totally different from any other maple I'm aware of. And this monster on the corner is a weeping um, white pine. It's just one, one pine. And we're starting to train it, so at some point now we're going to have a, an arch going all the way across. This is an Austrian pine, and I think it's most wonderful with, with the reds and the purples behind it. This is our newest addition to the yard. I don't think we have room for anything more. This is called a snake bark tree, and it will get quite high. I don't know, 40 feet probably, but isn't that an unusual thing? Some lovely um, wow. original specimens there, yeah. and I know you've been there, Tom. Yeah, they uh, actually their garden was on our garden tour mm -hmm. last year through the Duluth Garden Flower Society, and people were just in awe of their plant collection. Yeah. And one of the things that Paul had pointed out was the uh, the Dawn Redwood or the California Redwood that they've had growing for about a decade mm -hmm. in their garden. So here we're growing redwoods here in Duluth. So. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get to some more questions, and, and thank you to the Gregs for taking us on that tour. Um, but we have a question from a viewer that comes with a visual aid, and it's something you may have been hearing about. Ken S. has been finding small eggs on windows and soffit panels and wants to know, do you have any idea um, what laid the tiny eggs? He taped a penny to the window for a size comparison. You can there see it there now. Yeah, we've seen an awful lot of this in different houses throughout Duluth. And, uh, 
The consensus is that they're really, these are the eggs from one of the nocturnal uh, moths. And whether they're native or whether they've come in, uh, it's a little hard to say. There are 200 different cutworm species out there. And this is the, uh, this is the actual egg, which will, of course, uh, hatch into a larva, which is the cutworm. So here we got a shot of the egg mass, which we appreciate the fact they sent that in. Um, they're nocturnal. Uh, they um, can do a fair amount of damage in the garden, but a lot of these are hatching and they may not be a major problem in our gardens. They're, mm -hmm. they're away from the garden. I think people should just be aware with all cutworms, and they've been with us every year. Maybe we had a very warm spring. Maybe it was March and April's weather that brought these out. Maybe sure. they came in on the trade winds. Uh, so even so, uh, all tomatoes should be protected, peppers, and probably any coal crops, transplants, the cabbage, the broccoli, the cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. But and it's pretty typical that we protect from cutworms. Yeah. Is, that, is that correct? When I say protect, for many people, it's really easy just to wrap a newspaper mm -hmm. collar. Or other people will use uh, uh, aluminum foil if you like. But just a collar and make sure that's an inch below an inch above because these will creep right along the surface and mm. many of them will climb. They are nocturnal, so if you're going to do any control, do control in the evening. There okay. are a number of insecticides that are labeled and can be used as well. Okay, well I think that probably answers our, our question. A viewer wants to know what he can do to protect his garden plants from, from these new cutworms and it's really no different than the cutworms we've seen before. Do we want to get those eggs off the windows and screens? I would. It's, okay. Yeah, you know you're destroying the, uh, <clears throat> the population there. The other thing, you want to make sure that you've got all of the organic material wiped off of the soil surface when you're planting. Uh, partially decomposed material that hasn't broken down. Uh, this is where these moths like to lay their eggs, so get rid of all that. And then fall plow is another way to try to interrupt this cycle so they don't become native in your, in your garden plot. Okay, great information. Well, lots more questions coming in on this rainy evening, so let's get to them. Surely, London Marengo says her peonies uh, last fall were transplanted from her friend. The leaves are curling, stems, branches are wilting. What what might be wrong? Well, they certainly could be struggling a little bit from that transplant. Mm -hmm. You could also even be seeing, because depending on how wet it's been, uh, <clears throat> peonies are almost disease and fungus free, but there is one problem, botrytis, which is a pretty common fungus, and you'll see some of that curling and twisting okay. and blackening. Could be that, um, unfortunately, by the time you see it, it's too late, uh, but what you can do is go in and, and snap those, remove those leaves or those branches where you're seeing that, and that should slow that down and hope for sunnier days. Okay. <laughs> Anne-Marie from Sandstone has a magnolia bush. It's two years old. Each year it gets a few leaves but no flowers. This year, no leaves. She's wondering if she should give up on it. <clears throat> well, <laughs> at this point, if she's got no leaves and no flowers, it's got no life. Um, <laughs> it's so time to move she, on, huh? it might be time to, to try it again. And don't give up because we're seeing a lot of beautiful magnolias. A lot of magnolias. beautiful magnolia yeah. out there for sure. Uh, Teresa in Duluth has a wisteria vine, eight to ten years old, but never bloomed. Is wondering, does she need mulch yearly? Add compost. It's in uh, the south and gets sun, but not direct sun. <coughs> and that could be an, an over fertilizing if she's oh, giving it too okay. much fertilizer. They're very sensitive to too much fertilizing, so back off. But even with wisteria, they can take seven to ten years before they bloom. Uh, okay. So give it time. She's really within that window of when they'll come into bloom. Be a so. patient gardener. Yes. Sometimes that's tough to do. Yeah. Um, Judy or Jody rather from Duluth says that last year her green beans were all foliage and no beans. Is this too much nitrogen? What can I do to change the situation? Well, she wants to start with a good productive variety. Variety selection is extremely important there. And then, uh, you know, actually the bean crop will take quite a bit of nitrogen, so I really don't think that's the issue. You never really want to over-fertilize. Maybe she should back off if she's been using synthetic and just go to a good compost or well-rotted manure and, uh, and then be very particular. Varieties, uh, you know, green crop is a great uh, variety. Uh, Bush Blue Lake, number 274, great variety. So they're, they're very, very productive varieties. Uh, look for the good hybrids and she should be. She should okay. find something that will work for her. John from Duluth has a four-year-old brandy wine maple. Uh, the top four feet has no leaves or so signs of life. Should they trim? Uh, what could they do? Yeah, really, he's going <coughs> to seem to be getting a bit of a cold. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they should go in and clean that up. Okay. You know, unfortunately, if it's lost that much, it, it's probably not going to look very nice by the time they remove that, but they can continue to try and see if it will grow out of it. So. Okay, Kathy in Superior has a lilac shrub. The flowers are brown and curling up. As you see, our lilacs, uh, you know, they look good, but uh, they're coming to the end here. 
Yeah. Um, she says the leaves are fine, but I don't know if maybe the, the flowers didn't look good this year. Well, you know, ours do. Yeah, <laughs> and, and really pretty stunning all over the place. It could be a soil condition, okay. or they could just be finishing up. That's right. With the, the heat that we've had. Can they get too much rain? Uh, generally, lilacs, really, if you're going to see a rain issue, it's going to be later in the year when we start to see powdery mildew and some of the funguses that cause problems. Okay. But generally, not too much rain. Here's a, oh, I'm sorry. Here's a bit of a, of a challenging one. Val on Skyline Drive is looking for a shrub with privacy. She wants it six foot high, deer resistant, fast growing, attracting hummingbirds and butterflies, berries for the birds. And she said she looked at a honeysuckle in Arnold's Red, but that was invasive on the DNR side. I'm going to answer quick and then Bob can. <laughs> Don't we all, Val? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Bob. Well, she really wants it. She, wa she wants it to flower in the shade as well. She missed that part. It, the, one of the real challenges there is the deer resistance along with, you know, all these other beautiful fruiting characteristics, don't you think, Tom? Yeah. And, yep. Uh, maybe there's some trade-offs. So you've got to plant. Uh, we've talked a lot about spruce. There's your deer-resistant uh, evergreen shrub, and maybe we need to intermingle that with some of the honeysuckles and other things. Right. And, and lilacs are great uh, deer resistant attract hummingbirds butterflies uh, there we go so that would be a good one okay well that's all the time we have for questions right now gee it sure went by fast we do want to thank everybody that uh, called in and uh, we want to mention a couple of things that are coming up before we have to uh, end here tonight um, first of all the forest in focus photography contest is uh, going on right now and it's a great opportunity to get in your natural surroundings and identify wild plants so go to our website for more information and uh, to the soil and water conservation district site for all the details and remember we will be airing pictures of some of the entries here on great gardening next month and Tom you had a couple of things yeah, you wanted we got to mention a couple as well. of great things coming up this Saturday it's the 18th annual Duluth Garden Flower Society's plant sale it starts early 8 o'clock in the morning rain or shine lots and lots of plants okay. all the money raised from it goes to support local public beautification that happens in and around our community and then our tickets are available for the secret garden tour now they can go to our web page and they can find that on uh, the PBS webpage and one of the gardens we just talked about, the Greggs. Okay, the Greggs. and that's all the time Sorry. we have. Thanks again to, to you guys, to our phone, volu phone volunteers, and to all of you for watching from all of us here. Thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.